All right, so I'm going to get this started. So uh, it is five o'clock on the West Coast. I'm uh, I've moved this to uh, to an hour earlier. I see Christian is typing in the chat. I can't believe that you're making it here at this time in the morning for you, Christian. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, so welcome to the January edition of the Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Um, my name is Ken Pulse, and uh, I'm going to be doing the feature presentation uh, today. But before we do that, I'm going to sort of just go through and and do the standard, um, you know, the standard uh, stuff that we always do. Uh, thanks to the sponsor. Uh, Skill Wave Training, which is my training uh, company that uh, I run with Matt Allington, where we have some fantastic uh, Excel and Power BI training. If you haven't checked it out, you definitely should. Uh, Excel Guru is my parent company, and Monkey Tools, um, the software that I'm going to be uh, talking about today as well, are the sponsors for the evening. Um, just to let you a little bit uh, know a little bit of what's coming up here um, next week, because I was uh, a week delayed on this one here, uh, we've got Phil Seamark is going to be joining us to talk about new DAX functions in Power BI. Um, so that's going to be pretty cool. He's been coming all the way from New Zealand. Uh, well, virtually <laughs> in order to get this done. So we'll be starting at the same uh, regular time, 5 p.m. Pacific time here. Uh, and then our next Excel meetup is going to be on February 2nd. So we've got a couple of meetups coming up in quick succession here. And Celia Alvis is going to be coming back to join us again. She's going to be talking about dynamic array functions. So this is uh, that's going to be pretty cool stuff coming up. So looking forward to both of those. And the RSTPs are open now. Um, if you are looking for the VanPug meetup recordings, those are hosted on the SkillWave YouTube channel. The link is here. All of the slide decking is already posted on the site, I believe. Uh, so you can always find those and check those out. I uh, just want to throw a quick uh, note out to Monkey Shorts. Now, I haven't actually posted any new Monkey Shorts um, so far in January. I will be getting back to those uh, probably early February, I think, uh, just based on what I've got on my uh, my list right now. But the most recent episodes you can find, uh, three minutes or less of content, just say uh, we did a comparing versus prior row in Power Query, how to unfill and, and numbering group rows, which is a pretty cool pattern as well. Uh, if you're interested in checking out some bite-sized stuff, uh, maybe start re-watching the list from last year because there's all kinds of good stuff that's in there. Um, yeah, not enough hours in the day. Absolutely right, Santon, you bet. Um, so uh, so listen, uh, the next thing I want to just talk about real quickly here. Uh, next week is uh, the kickoff for um, two of the courses that I'm doing, which are coached courses where we run on a semester basis. One of those is the Excel Fundamentals Bootcamp. If you feel that your Excel game is um, entry level or you have people in your organization where you feel that that is the case, uh, we would love to have them in this program. Uh, it is a coach program that we go through teaching people core skills to get them ready for things like um, power, well, a lot of the uh, data modeling and stuff that we do here. So we teach them some pair of power queries, some pivot tables, data visualization theories. It's got quite Q&A sessions, ask me anything sessions, a year long subscription, all kinds of stuff. Uh, if that is of interest to you, uh, to you or somebody in your organization that you know, uh, please let them know about it. Uh, in addition, of course, um, we also have my uh, uh, world famous self service BI bootcamp, which I can actually say I've, uh, I've taught in several different countries, which is great. Um, this one also starts in January 18th. So next week, it is not too late to register for this thing here. And I'm super excited to say that the program that we actually have here, which includes up to about 40 hours of training and coaching is going to get longer. Um, so I am actually going to be adding some, uh, some stuff in here about some data visualization, uh, which is going to be happening during the semester, which is what I promised to people. Um, this is uh, probably the last time the program is going to be offered for the price that it is because there's going to be a bunch of new content. The price will probably be going up. So just keep that in mind. Um, so new stuff coming. Anyway, it's a good time to sign in for, uh, for this stuff as well. Um, Last thing I want to just say is if you are interested in speaking at VanPug, we always love to get new speakers on our stage here. We are still looking for speakers for our 2023 calendar. So if you've got cool stuff that you want to show about Power BI or Excel or anything in the Power Platform, don't hesitate to get in contact with us. You can fill out the form at xlguru.ca slash speak at VanPug. We will get in touch and we would love to have you on this stage with us. So... I am now going to close this deck off and we're going to switch out to a different one uh, because what I'd like to do today, and if I can just find where the heck I actually stored it, there we go. Um, I promised a session on what's new in Monkey Tools. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start uh, with just the sort of the, the general basic kind of presentation that I usually lead with the build better Excel models faster, um, just because I don't know if all of you know um, 
the different pieces that are here. So if there's anybody that's new to this, I'll just give you a quick overview, and then we'll talk about some of the stuff that's new and what I've been actually working on with Monkey Tools as well. So if you don't know me, um, I am Ken Pulse. I run the uh, the user group here. Um, I'm a fully uh, certified accountant in Canada. I run ExcelGuru.ca, um, where we have, well, I should change that to articles because we've changed it out from blog to articles. It still is a blog, but that's what we're calling them now, uh, as well as a free help forum. I'm also one of the founding partners of Training, along with uh, Miguel Escobar and Matt Ellington, even though Miguel has now left us and gone to work at Microsoft. Uh, I am a Microsoft MVP, have been since 2006 across a variety of different categories. And I am, of course, a software developer and an author. I've written the Monkey Tools add-in for Excel, as well as a couple of books. Uh, the most two relevant to us, M is for Data Monkey, which has since been replaced by Master Your Data. Um, interestingly enough, uh, just as a, a sort of a side here, um, I actually get questions from people saying that they've read Master Your Data and where can they get a copy of M is for Data Monkey? And I've always asked why, because it is kind of an old book. The Master Your Data is sort of the more uh, important one that you want to be uh, watching uh, or for in, in the grand scheme of things here. Now, um, before I dive into talking about monkey tools and what we're doing, uh, I just want to talk a little bit quickly about my sort of philosophy around how I actually work with this stuff. Got to have the complete collection. Okay, fair enough, Stanton. There you go. Um, the back catalog, as it were. Um, so my philosophy on working with data to from data to dashboards works like this. We always start with a raw data set because if you don't, you're making it up. That's not ethical. It's not cool. So you really need to be starting from real data. Um, we then use Power Query to go and connect to the raw data. We create staging tables to do a lot of our data uh, reshaping and manipulation. And then we load those into our fact and dimensional tables that we actually need in order to serve up our power pivot data model. Within that data model, we relate tables, we create our DAX formulas. And then from there, that's where we're going to pull these things into visuals, whether those are pivot tables and pivot charts, or whether you're in Power BI working with a vast array of visuals that they actually have there. Okay, So this is just sort of the data to dashboards journey that we go through when we're actually building a proper model in, that we want to uh, reuse or, or you know, to try and get our analysis done. Uh, it's all about trying to figure out the right tools for the right job in a lot of these places. Now, my philosophy when I actually build things here is that I start everything Excel. Um, I've been working with Excel for a long time. I work in finance. My job is typically Excel based. What I will do today, though, is I'll take an Excel model and I'll actually publish it to Power BI. And you can publish directly from Excel to Power BI, um, providing that it has, well, actually, whether it's a standard workbook or whether it has data model components, you get different things when you do this. Um, but I publish my data modeling components to Power BI. Um, I'll then go and I build more reports uh, online in uh, Power BI if I need to do so, and I can share it with my audience that way. There are times, however, after I've built things in Excel that I realize I need more things that are suited in Power BI, things like role level security, or maybe there's some visuals that I just don't have the ability to do in Excel. So for those, what I'll do is after I've done my work in Excel, import it to Power BI Desktop, and then build my reports, publish to PowerBI.com and potentially build more reports online. And this is one of the philosophies that I actually teach throughout the self-service business intelligence bootcamp at SkillWave is sort of you know how to actually put these things together and, and what you can actually do with them, how similar Excel's uh, data model is to Power BI and, and things like that. So the big sort of key core component in this thing here is I start everything in Excel. It's because that's where I'm comfortable and it's because for the job that I do, Excel is often better suited than Power BI, okay? now. This is where Monkey Tools kind of comes into play here. And the target audience for Monkey Tools is for people that work like I do. It's Excel users generally that are building models with Power Query and Power Pivot. Although there are times when we'll connect to a model that we get from Power BI and pull it into Monkey Tools in order to audit so we can actually see what's going on with it. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, there are three pricing levels within, um, within Monkey Tools. There is a forever free version. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm an MVP is because of my community contributions and one of the primary things that I wanted to make sure of when I built the software is that there was a reason that people would want this on their computer and always to have a significant set of features that are free that would still justify you actually wanting to install it. Um, I only have one code base which means that whenever I publish a bug fix, it goes into all versions, that's it. I'm not interested in having a free version that has bugs where the pro version doesn't, that's not cool. Um, so, you know, as I say, the forever free, you'll still see updates, you'll get new features and all these kind of things. It's just that when you get into the pro license, you're gonna find that you have more. 
So we do have a trial of the pro license, which is two weeks. Uh, after that, it reverts to a free license. So, you know, you don't even need to uninstall it or to install a different version. It'll just fall back to free. And then if you do decide, hey, I really do need that feature and you decide to invest in a pro license subscription, all of the features will light up once you actually put your license key in. Um, if you're interested in taking a look at the details on this, you can find uh, find them here. We've got a full website at monkeytools.ca. Um, it's got our homepage. It's got our pricing model, the easy place to go and just and click install your trials and whatnot. Uh, we've got our features listing, a knowledge base with a bunch of support articles and, you know, how to get to your account and contact us and stuff like that. Okay, so that's just sort of the basic background on um, monkey tools, I guess, is an overall level. So what is it? Well, Basically what happens is when you install monkey tools in Excel, you get a new ribbon and it's the monkey tools ribbon, which you can sort of see right down here called monkey tools. Um, I divide things into two sort of categories here. My philosophy behind this is I'm trying to come up with one ribbon tab that I never need to switch so that I can get all my jobs done. So in order to do this, I've collected some of Excel's features. Um, this is what I call convenience features. These are natural Excel features. I haven't done anything to change them whatsoever. I just put them on my ribbon and then we added a whole bunch of monkey tools specific features and there's a lot of buttons here that are highlighted um, but the really cool thing is when you actually hit on some of these menus like query monkeys measure monkeys model sleuth there's a heck of a lot of options under these things there's a lot of commands and i was actually reflecting today as i was trying to push out the build of the uh, of the updates those two how much stuff this has grown into when i started with something very very simple in vba once upon a time uh this is now a full-blown add-in that uh is has got lots of code going on and a heck of a lot of features in it so i'm really proud of what what we've actually built here and i hope that uh that you guys will find this uh, interesting um, along the way here. Uh, so the first thing I want to just talk about really quickly here is what we've updated since the last um, publish that I've actually done here, or the last time that I've really talked about Monkey Tools. Uh, I published a new version of Monkey Tools about an hour ago. Okay, that's how fresh this is. So if you happen to get an update to Monkey Tools within the last couple of weeks, you are still going to want to go and do an update now to get to version 1.0.8412. 0.26100. Okay, that's today's release on this thing. And what that has in here is it has a few different things that we've done to, um, to fix some things and, and make things a little bit better. So one of the things that I've done is that the parameter table um, that we were actually able to inject previously had one parameter that was included with it by default. It was called a uh, file path and it was actually the folder path. Um, I've now changed that. It now includes by default a folder path, a file path, and a file name. And the file path is actually the file path this time instead of the folder path. So I've made some changes there. Um, so that's one thing that it does right off the bat. You can always delete the ones you don't want, but it makes things a little bit easier when we're working with one of the new features that I added. A major change that I have been trying to chase to fix for years and years and years, finally got some help from one of my friends on this one here, uh, Jan Carl Paters on this one. Um, I now have it set so that when you open a monkey tools form, it stays on top of the Excel workbook, not every freaking application on your computer. So you can flip over to Power BI and the monkey tools form will not be in front of Power BI. And then you can come back to Excel and it will be in front of the Excel workbook. And if you happen to open a different Excel workbook and bring it on front, that's okay the Excel form will stay on front of the workbook it belongs with, not overall on Excel top. So this was a big, big thing. Um, it's one of those things that probably a lot of people won't even notice because now it works right. Um, but it was a huge, uh, huge thing that's been driving me crazy for years. Um, another thing that you probably won't care about um, is that I've actually uh, managed to add a timestamp to the installer and the digital certificate. Uh, what that means is that now when the digital certificate that I have expires, um, Monkey Tools will still show up on your ribbon. It doesn't just disappear, which means that you won't have to uninstall it and reinstall a new version, which is a kind of a small thing. Uh, um, except not to me. Uh, it also includes, of course, a variety of bug fixes. Um, I want to thank everybody um, for reporting bugs to me. Uh, there's a nice little feature in there where you can report them when you find them. Uh, I can't promise that I fixed everything that's been reported. As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you that I haven't, but I have fixed a bunch of them uh, that have been reported to me, um, as well as uh, fixing a bunch that I found uh, along the way as well. So if you do find bugs, please use the feature uh, listing on the help menu to, uh, or on the about menu to go and, um, and report them to me so that I can get them nailed because nobody likes bugs. Um, next thing I want to talk about is new features. So this is the part that everybody gets really excited about when you talk about it. Um, one feature that I've got is that I have a new function called a smart file function. Um, 
I just downloaded and didn't get blocked by IT security. Well, that's a happy thing. I love that. Okay, cool. Good stuff. Um, so the smart file function, um, this is in the forever free version. Uh, basically, this is very similar to the smart folder function that we had before. Uh, it allows dynamically switching the file path for a, an individual file. So this is specifically targeted at Excel files. And when you open your workbook, if you're using a path to actually retrieve the relative path of the workbook, Sometimes it'll be a local path on your hard drive. Sometimes it'll be a SharePoint path. And if you've ever done this, you'll know that if it switches on you, you're stuffed. It doesn't work because it needs a different connector. So the smart file function allows you to dynamically switch that without having to worry about whether you've opened it from local or remote paths. I take care of all the hard work in that. Now, the reason this is forever free is because this just injects the function and then you have to do the work to hook it up. Okay? If you're on a pro license, at that point, we have a smart file monkey that does all the hard work for you. All you have to do is point to the file and say, here we go, and boom, it sets it up for you. And I will do you, I give you a demo of this uh, in a little bit here. Now, that's a small thing, though. This is a big one. I've released a new feature called BiblioMonkey, and this is a mixed licensing scenario. BiblioMonkey works on a forever free license, but it's got better features on pro license. And it's got more features that will be coming to the pro license as I build them. Um, I literally put the final, I'm going to get this out the door and into your guys' hands, um, like I say, an hour ago with BiblioMonkey. So um, I've been working really hard on this. There are a couple of things that I've had to release in its initial state that I'm not in love with. And I'm going to talk about those as we go through this. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback on this as we go through. So please feel, don't be shy to use the chat. Uh, if you've got questions or even, you know, um, throw up your hand on mute and come off and, and talk about it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into demos right now. We're going to go take a look at the uh, features here. And I think I'm just going to actually get rid of my deck altogether. Um, I'm going to start right now just from a blank workbook. And um, what we're going to work with here is uh, I'm going to do a quick little demo of the smart file, um, smart folder function. So the very first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to close this workbook and I'm going to go file new because I want to make sure that everybody realizes that I really do have a blank workbook here. Uh, so I'm going to go and do a quick little save as on this. And uh, we're going to go and try and find the uh, demos folder where I want to put it. And I'm going to go and save this over something called Smart Pass here. So this is basically just an empty workbook. Yes, it works. it's already there. I get it. And there we go. Now, first thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to go over to my Monkeys Tools tab here. And I'm going to insert um, a parameter table and function. This is one of those forever free features. Okay, So if we go and inject this into the workbook, here we go. We now get a table that has a folder path, a file path, and a file name all listed here. Um, it also has the fn get parameter function all hooked up, ready to go. If you are on a free license and you want to use this to leverage the fn get parameter to read from this table and use it in your stuff, you can do that. The, fun the function's already injected, away you go. You just have to hook things up yourself. No big deal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a couple of little changes here. I'm going to go uh, read, uh, rename this one here. We're going to change the file. This is going to be build better dash uh, begin dot uh, xlsx. Now. By default, I drop in the file name for the workbook that you are actually working with, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna change this guy here. We're gonna see equals this and this because this is the workbook that I wanna connect to. I'm not interested in connecting to this one. I wanna connect to a different workbook and see what I can get out of it. This particular workbook is stored in the same folder as what we have here, okay? Which is being dynamically generated by this little function here, all right? Automatically injected for you under the name folder path for the folder, file path for the actual name of the file, and then file name individually so you can change this and have multiple if you need it. So here's what I'm going to do start with is I'm going to start with a smart folder monkey. So this is the classic um, smart folder monkey that we had before. It asks which parameter holds the file path and it, it or for the uh, folder path rather, and it precedes it right now with folder path. So I'm just going to say, okay. And what would I like to call the new query files list is good enough. And at this point, it's going to come back and it's going to ask me for some information because we've got a form of a firewall issue because we need to know about the data source. So I'm just going to hop in here and clear my privacy levels. So we're going to continue. We're going to tell it that the current workbook is organizational, just like my SharePoint data source. And then it'll probably complain that I need to log in because of, you know, want to do that. So let's just see what actually happens here. Oh, no. Okay, today didn't. So there we go. This is pulling a listing of all of the files that are in the SharePoint folder here. Now, 
One of the things that happens in this particular thing is I've added something for the smart folder path here. Um, it actually comes back and it removes the original root URL from this thing, which means that I can now go and filter on this one here to say, hey, I'm going to go through and just filter this thing. I only care about things that actually don't have a subfolder here. So I'm going to get a much shorter list of things. Or I could filter to a specific subfolder if, or if I wanted to do that. Um, this is good enough for me right now. I'm just going to go and say uh, close. And I'm going to actually load this to a table on a worksheet. And there's a reason that I want to do this. So here we go. And some of the stuff's just going to get wiped out, which is fine because you can't load binaries and whatnot. Uh, but there we go. We've now got a little table that shows our, our individual files that are actually in this subfolder. So that's the first part. Now, that's existed for a long time. You can reference this. You can combine the files. You can do what you need to do with it. Okay, Nice and easy. And I'll show you a little bit later here. Um, I'm going to show you that we can actually change the file path here to a local path, and it will still refresh. Before I do that, though, I want to show you the new feature. So this one here is Smart File Monkey because what if I want to get to this specific build better dash begin file? Well, it lists it in here, right? So historically, what I would do is I would create this files list. Uh, yes, um, Monkey Tools does work on Excel desktop only, uh, not on Excel online. That is correct, Henry. Um, having said that, uh, if you build queries that will refresh online, uh, you do not need Monkey Tools to refresh anything. Um, all Monkey Tools does is help you build your stuff. It doesn't leave any hooks in your workbook and doesn't require being installed, right? This is a, a tool that was very important to me when I built this. I'm not trying to get a license to every machine inside the organization. The people that use it, those are the people that I'd like to have a license for it. The people who don't, well, they should be able to open a workbook that somebody's built with Monkey Tools and never know that Monkey Tools was involved. Okay, so if you build stuff that's compatible with Excel Online, it'll work. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, but it won't run in Excel Online. You're, you're quite correct. All right, so back to the scenario that I'm sort of looking at here. I want to get at this file, build better dash begin. So historically, what I would do is I would create a files list. I'd create point to the entire folder, filter down to the one file I wanted, and then drill into it. Well, that's a lot of extra overhead. Why would I want to do that? Why can't I get just directly to the specific file? So that's what Smart File Monkey does. Comes back, it says which parameter holds the file path. So I've already built this in Excel. So I'm going to go and say OK. And then it says, what do you want to call the new query? So you know what? Let's just call this Build Better because that's going to be the name of the actual file. So here we go Build Better. And what you can see now, if I go into this, this is actually giving me the contents from that file. Okay, so if I hop in here, now normally you'll have to clear the privacy levels on this thing, but I, I did that earlier when I was testing and everything else. Uh, but what you can see is inside this build better file, we've got a summary table, uh, we've got a data table, we've got a table one categories and sales. And this this will come into play in, in a little bit as well, because I'm actually going to work on this file. But there we go. I've actually now connected directly to this particular Excel file via the SharePoint file path. So I'm going to say close and load. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go and, and just drill into this one here. So let's go and uh, drill into the categories table right here, just so we get something that looks like data. There we go. Uh, all right, close and load. And now I'm going to go and load to just change this one here to load to a table as well. All right, so you can see that this is actually pretty easy. Once you uh, once you have your file path there, you just point to it and boom, everything is good. Clear the uh, clear the um, the privacy prompts or set the privacy levels. Rather, you might have to log in to SharePoint, um, but all of those things can be done when you see the little yellow exclamation mark on the query. Now that I've got this done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit save, and I'm going to close Excel. And now I'm going to go over to SharePoint. Actually, first I just want to see watch and see. Hopefully, this will sync relatively quickly today. It uh, looks like uh, it sinks six minutes ago. That seems like it's a little bit uh, not quite as fast as I want it to go. It's processing a change. I'm just going to let it sit for a second here because I kind of like to see this one update. Uh, there we go. That's better. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm now going to go and pause syncing. Okay. So we're going to pause it for two hours. And at this point, I'm going to go and reopen the same file. So hopefully this should now come back with the local file pass or being returned from this, this cell function. So if you've ever done this before and you've connected directly to the file using a local path or a SharePoint path and you try to switch things, you'll know that it blows up because the connectors are different. You have to use a web connector for what the web-based file, the SharePoint Excel file, and you have to use the local file path or local one. It's, it's ridiculous. It should allow you to do this automatically. Um, but hey, you know what? we have the ability to do things because here we go. This is what I'm going to do is I'm going to go refresh all. And what you're going to see is that it does a refresh 
and something has changed. Now the contents of the file haven't changed because I haven't done anything to them, but this one did. It added this one, okay? Now down the bottom, we've got tilde dollar sign. This is absolutely indicative of the fact that I am in the smart pass file. And when you open from a local folder, it creates a temp file, which you see with the tilde sign that is actually living inside the folder here. And if I were to go and do a refresh on this, we should, well, it's probably hidden actually, because it's a hidden file, um, but it is actually stored inside this. I'm actually surprised that I don't have my hidden files on. What do they do with this stupid ribbon? Come on, uh, never mind. I won't fight with that one, but it is in there for sure. Okay, so if I now go and close this and turn syncing back on, uh, what we'll find at that point in time is that it will still work. So I can actually do that. We can close this one down. Don't bother saving it. Uh, I guess I could have saved it, but uh, if I go back here, resume syncing, there we go. We'll let it do its thing, sign in first. That's important, there we go. Now, if I come back here and reopen it again, it's gonna automatically go and pick up the um, web-based version. You can see with the paths here. And if I do a refresh on this thing again, Actually, I guess it would help to show the little thing there, but it's done its refresh and we don't have the tilde icon here because when you're actually accessing a file from SharePoint, it doesn't do that, okay? So there you go. This thing will actually work very, very nicely for these things. So we've now got smart file and smart folder. This is specifically targeted at Excel files because those are the things that end up having dynamic file paths that you end up working with. Um, I don't believe that we have a need for it for CSV files, um, but uh, you know what, if you uh, find that that's not true, let me know and I will change it. I'll add something new for it. So, so that's one of the new features, okay? So something for building things that are dynamic so you can you know, still see it when you're on an airplane. Um, all right, I'm gonna toss this one away. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move into the build better file. Um, and I wanna just sort of walk through just sort of a general demo of some things. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things that are kind of interesting now. So my goal, with this is to go and build a pivot table that looks like this. Um, I'm not going to bother building the pivot chart, uh, but basically I've got three tables in this workbook. And if you can see here, we have uh, nothing on the uh, the side over here. So there's uh, no, um, no queries in the workbook at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by using um, one of our pro features, Table Monkey, to go and build queries in a staging setup following the, the pulse staging method to get the stuff done. One of the things that you'll notice right away, though, with these tables, I have a blue table. These are the Excel workbook tables that we actually have right here. We've got a categories table, a sales table, and we've got one called Table 1. And I'm like, what the heck, who called that table one? And if I click on this, it will actually select it for me. And we can see from the table design, it is indeed called table one. So here's something that's not obvious to a lot of people. If you right click on it, you can actually rename it. So I can call it something like budgets. And what this does, is it will actually rename all of these things going all the way through. It's also renamed the table in the workbook. So this makes it very, very visual what's going on with this and you can actually clean things up. Uh, if you don't want to load all these things, maybe you've already got one in place here, for example, you can go and uncheck budgets and that will not make any queries for it. Bring it back. Uh, we can uncheck loading to the data model. So this will create connection only queries all the way along here. Uh, if you want less layers of staging queries, you can dial these things down or dial them up, whichever you like to do. And if you want to change the preferences because you don't like raw data and staging, you can do that right here. But for me right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and say create. And what this is gonna do now is it's gonna go and start creating some queries here. Now, what I want is I want a raw data query that reads from the data source, a staging query where I'm gonna do the majority of manipulation, and then some tables that load to the data model. In order to do this, it would take me probably about three, or three to five minutes. Um, it's done in six seconds. So that worked out pretty nice. Those things are all loading to the data model and I can actually prove that out by going to the data model. Um, and there we go. If I go and take a look at the tables, there we are. We got budgets and categories. Uh, unfortunately, I don't do any automatic relationship detection. You know, it's funny. I hate that feature in Power BI, but I want to learn how to do it myself. But uh, at any rate, so for right there, I can set this up. We've now got our tables in the data model with our data. So that looks good so far. But there's a problem. I don't have a table to link my dates together. So this is one of the, what I think is one of the cool killer functions um, that is a pro feature inside Power Query or inside Monkey Tools is our calendar monkey. So I have a recipe pattern for doing this. I should also point out this query down the bottom here really quickly. 
um, as we're doing this. So you saw it just came in and it disappeared. Uh, that was something I actually added back in about August last year. Um, and what it does is it allows me to go through and look at the metadata behind your query sets because using code, um, we can only actually query the uh, columns for tables that are in the data model, we can't actually query the power query columns themselves. So what that's doing is it's actually allowing me to go in and check the schema of the tables. And what that means is when I'm actually looking at these tables now, I can actually look at and figure out what the columns are in those tables. Now, the problem with this thing is if the file is web-based, it can take some time to run. So under the uh, under the options monkey, under global options, uh, there is a, an ability here to disable enhanced query metadata analysis. If you find it's taking too long, you can turn that on. Um, I want to make this a little bit smarter where it automatically disables it for, uh, for web-based files, but I haven't done that yet. So just keep that in mind. But the cool thing about this now is that it actually recognizes date as one of the columns from staging sales, even though it hasn't loaded anywhere yet, which is kind of nice. Um, so that's a cool little feature here. You can also see that if I go to staging categories, it tells me, hey, there's no date columns in this table, which is absolutely true. You can see that by looking at the raw data here, there's no date columns. Okay, so, so this is kind of a, a nice little add um, because it never used to do that. Now I'm gonna set this up to go from staging budgets for these things. This will be the column that has the earliest dates, latest dates in my model. And I'm gonna choose myself a new year end because I use a September 30th year end. Recognize on this, I'm using 2023 year. I'm just grabbing a valid year end. My data does not span that far, but it's okay. Monkey Tools is smart enough to figure out what your year end should be. This is the default that you see when you choose a non-standard year end that is a 12 month year end. It comes up with the columns that you can choose here. Um, we learn from your defaults. So if you change the checkboxes on this, when you open this up next time, we'll precede it with that because we think there's a pretty good chance that you use the same calendar all the time. If you decide to use a 445, there'll be an additional periodicity column over here for period IDs, year ID, month ID, things like that, so that you can make comparative measures. Um, but uh, I'm not using that for right now. I'm gonna say next. Uh, if I had chosen these tables as the ones to pull my earliest and latest date, these would automatically be checked. Because I chose the staging tables, it doesn't know for sure that they're related, so it doesn't check those automatically. So I'm gonna make those things happen, and I'm gonna say okay, and what you should see here is that we create our start date and end date, just like my Power Query recipe patterns. And then it's loaded 1,096 rows to the data model. And it's given us some advice down the bottom here because there are some things that I cannot do for you automatically. Those things, unfortunately, include hiding the foreign keys. Now I'm going to hide all these guys. Okay, I can't hide foreign keys automatically, wish I could. Um, if you know anybody at Microsoft that you can convince to get them to do that for me, that'd be great. I've been talking to the engineers directly and they say those are great feedback items, Ken, but we don't have time to do it yet. Uh, so you have to do that part manually. The other thing that I wish I could do for you automatically and I can't, another great feedback option, Ken, was this one here on the calendar table. I would really like to be able to set these things up by code, to sort my month by my fiscal or month of fiscal year and my day short by the um, day of week. But again, unfortunately, there is no, um, there's nothing here for us uh, that allows us to actually do that. So, um, so gotta do that part manually. But once we've got it done, uh, the cool thing is, is that we've now got our calendar table linked into the data model ready to go. Now, um, the next thing obviously that we need before we start building pivot tables, we need measures. So I'm a big fan of the no code approach to doing things, even though I write pro code behind the scenes to build this tool. Um, here's the, uh, I'm sorry, here is the calendar table marked as a date table. Uh, no, the calendar table is not marked as a date table automatically. And in all honesty, there's actually very little reason that you need to do this. Okay, so uh, here comes the controversial statement. I never mark my calendar tables as official date tables. Never, don't need to, it's not necessary. Why? Um, my understanding is the only reason you ever need to actually go and uh, where the heck is that setting anyway on this thing? It's, is it on this one? It's on design. It's on design, right? Yeah, there we go. The only reason you ever need to do this is if you're using a primary key that is not recognized as an actual date. If you're using something that's an ID number, that's when you have to tell it that it is actually a calendar or it is actually a date table. But if you don't need to, or if, you, if you're using a primary key that is actually dates, this is actually not relevant. Okay, so there you go. So fun stuff there. Um, and uh, I had to go and look that one up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, 
so we need measures. That's the next part. So as I say, I'm a big fan of no code. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and create, uh, we've got a little thing here for basic explicit measures. This is one of the things that um, Power BI has a really cool um, feature for building complex measures. Uh, it's got natural language intelligence now for building measures, which is kind of neat. But what they don't have is they don't have an easy to use interface to build a basic explicit measure. So if I were to look at something like this with budgets and hit amount, you can see that we suggest, hey, you probably want to sum this and here's the measure signature for it right there. You can name it. You can say, you know, choose your formats and say create. Okay, nice and easy. Why is this useful? Well, because with other things here, we give you all of the different pieces here that you can use. You'll notice in this particular case here, we don't let you use last date on your budgets amount column because it's not a date column. But what if I wanted to do something like, I don't know, like this, I wanted to say calendar and date I actually wanted to get the last date as a measure. Well, I can absolutely do that. Even if I don't know about the last date function, we're automatically picking up the calendar table from the model. I'll just change this to last date. I'm gonna leave it in a short date format, hit create measure, and that's automatically created it on the table. Now I could do this for each measure that I wanna create, but that's a lot of work. So I'm gonna use this one, multiple explicit measures. If you haven't seen this cool little thing here, this will scan all of the fact tables in my model. So these are all the ones on the many-sided relationship. It's got stars all the way around it. Uh, you can pick up disconnected tables if you have them or specifically dedicated measure tables. Um, I just leave this one here. You can even pick up your dimension tables if you want. Now, I know a lot of people that like to store their measures on dedicated measure tables. I default to your host table unless you happen to have a dedicated measure table. And if you want one, you can go and click on this and say add, and boom, there we go. It's added a new measure table here. However, it does give us some advice again, okay? So what this is telling us is that we should hop into the data model over here. Oops, go to the measures table and hide this column from client tools, okay? You can do it there or you can do it here, right? Click and hide from client tools. Um, you can inject that table from here. You can also, inject one right here. Again, this is a pro feature inside Monkey Tools. Anything below this line, uh, actually anything below this line here is pretty much a pro feature, okay? Now, what that's gonna do is this is now gonna act as a home for our measures. So I'm gonna go say next. And what you see here is the multi-measure monkey in action. And basically what this is doing is it says, hey, there's a conflict in this because measure names need to be unique in the model. We do have two amount columns, one on the budget table, one on the sales table. Your columns can have the same name across multiple tables because they are on each individual table, but your measure names must be unique. The blue one is the first instance. Anything red is a conflict with the first instant. I'm going to go and change this to budget dollars. You'll notice that the red has gone away because we can now have a measure called sum amount. Not that I want one. I'm going to call this one sales dollars. Uh, I'm going to change the format to a pre, I've pre-selected what I think the most common formats are here. So this is a currency um, with no currency indicator and no decimals. That's what I want. So there we go, we'll set that up. And I'm also gonna add another aggregation to this. So I'll click the box here. Uh, the one that I want is I'm actually not gonna use the amount category or date columns. I'm gonna refer to the table directly, sales, which is the same as what's up here. And you'll notice that the only aggregation function I can choose here is count rows, where for a column, I actually have lots of options, okay? What this is gonna give me, this is gonna give me my count of transactions, which I'm gonna put as a whole number. If I want other tables that aren't showing in here, I can click on this and it'll pop them up. If I wanna get rid of tables, I can click on the X. If I wanna get rid of a measure, I can click on the minus sign over here, okay? But for right now, I'm gonna hit create. It's gonna go through and create all these things. Boom, there we go. And it does tell you that, hey, you know what? You should really hide all the unaggregated fields that you've used. I can't do that for you automatically. I wish I could. If I could actually automatically hide the fields that you're aggregating, I would do it in a heartbeat because I think you really want to promote people using the explicit measures you've created. All right, so we got measures. We got relationships. Let's go build a pivot table. So here we go. We're going to go. And again, I'm on the monkey tools tab for all of this, right? So we're going to go pivots and filters, and we're going to go to a pivot table from the data model. Say OK. And I think what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to build a pivot table that has fiscal year on rows. Actually, let me take this off first. Let's do this one here, month short. First thing I want you to notice, they're sorting October, November, December. That's because I have a September year end. Okay. So here's my measures. We've got transactions, sales, and budget. There we are. That's nice. And if I now go and break it down by fiscal year, there we go. I've now got a nice little pivot table that's showing things the way that I want it. 
Um, from here, I would probably also go and add a nice little timeline to it. There we are. And now I have the ability to go in and say, hey, cool. I can go and filter and say, just show me the sales from you know October to March and give me you know my first, no, actually, I don't have any sales from March of 2020. Let me go back to 2019. That'll be better. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. There we are. So now we've got the sales showing for the uh, for the correct periods as well. Okay. So um, the nice thing about this thing is that with the the ability to go and automatically pull all of your uh, your tables directly in in the correct staging format, with the ability to go and create a calendar table on the fly, a measures table really quickly, um, build your measures really fast. Uh, this entire job end to end takes me about three minutes. Um, this job would take me a heck of a lot longer to do if I was actually trying to do all this stuff manually. So Monkey Tools is really seen here as an accelerator to um, to help you build better models faster. Right? Now, the thing is, is that everything I've shown you here is working through tools that I'm working with, right? So what if you have, uh, does monkey, monkey set the pivot table display formats from the measure creation process? Ah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so, so basically um, under the multiple explicit measure dialog, when we're creating these measures, the format is what I'm choosing here. Okay, so these are some preset ones. So if I'm using currency one, two, three, four, so this is the one that I chose. Um, what we have here is we have currency. It's got no currency indicator and no decimal places. Okay, that's what we're actually seeing in this case here versus something like this one here, which has got a currency indicator with dollars and two decimal places here or with dollars and no decimal places. And again, that currency indicator is your currency indicator, not mine. All right. So if you're in Europe and you're using euros, maybe Christian, um, at that point in time, you know, that's what you would actually see here. So if I now go and say, hey, let's go and actually manage that measure and look at sales, you can see that it is a currency and none. Okay, so this is setting up reading from those uh, those default processes that I actually created. Now, the other one that I created was actually, um, yeah, with native, uh, yeah, I, with a native Excel pivot table, you can set up those settings. There's there's only a, a finite list that I can do, like Power, Power Pivot serves up certain ones. It's very, very frustrating. I can't do custom ones. That like, drives me nuts. Um, but the other one that I just want to sort of point out because you've asked on this, uh, Henry, is this one here. When you go through and you're working with, actually, let me pick up an amount because it's got more. Uh, when you're working with building one of these things, I give you the full dialogue that you would expect in this case. So if you go to currency, true date, I mean, we, we basically rebuilt the entire thing that Power Pivot uses here. So if you get into uh, working with a currency format, um, if you want your different currencies here, this is the entire list of everything that Power Pivot does support. Um, so you can build the formats there. You can't go custom. You have to do that yourself through a, a, a cell custom number format. Okay. Um, all right. So one of the things that, that I'm really proud of with Monkey Tools is the amount of stuff that we've actually put into building things like individual queries that we have here in order to do very specific things. I mean, we've got a calendar monkey, we've got something for, you know, retrofitting a model for slowly changing dimensions, you know, your, your different pieces here. You'll also notice we have a couple of different things here for a get month ends function and the get ISO week function. These two pieces here are kind of interesting because they were interesting to me. I don't know how many people actually use those. So I got, I did get a request for the ISO week function because that one's pretty important in Europe, but the reality here is that, you know, I'll get ideas from people and they say, well, what about this? And you start thinking about, well, you know, is this function going to be useful to multiple people? Uh, is it worth investing in? Is it worth investing in putting my ribbon and cluttering things up, making things too long or not? This is a, a big challenge. And <clears throat> as I'm sure you can imagine, Microsoft struggles with this kind of stuff all the time. So for the longest period of time, people have been asking me, you know, is it possible that you'd be able to build something for us that we could use to it, to store our own measures on these things and whatnot? And uh, I have to say that this is something that I've been asked about since day one for Monkey Tools, and I've always wanted to get there and just haven't. Um, and I spent a significant amount of time working on this in order to get it done. So uh, here's what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to close this file off right now. Close it, say don't save. Uh, and I'm going to go and open up a new blank workbook here because I want to show you um, what I actually have been working on here. And this is this is the big piece from this new release is something called BiblioMonkey. So if you're not familiar with the term Biblio, um, Biblio is uh, is basically um, a library. Okay, Bibliotheque is, is French, and, and I believe it shows up in other languages as well. And uh, what we actually see here is that um, we've got a library that I've got preceded with some things. So. Um, 
your library, when you open this up in your monkey tools, the first time that you do this, you will get a, uh, you'll click on it. It's going to wait for a second. Then you're going to get a pop-up that says, hey, we created a new monkey tools library for you. So you're going to end up with an empty database. The only thing that's going to be in there is queries, measures, formulas, VBA, and office scripts. Like, Whoa, that's some interesting categories, Ken. If you want to change the file path for that, under the global options, you can do that here. You can actually browse for a new uh, a new file location. Um, I do think I need to do some work on this one here because it is actually asking you for a file. So typically you'll create it here and move it. I, I need to play around with this. I'd be curious to get people's feedback on that. Um, but here's the deal. What do we got, got in here? Let me expand my subfolders and I'll just show you what I've got in here. I've got a whole bunch of queries and I've got some measures that I've actually stored in here. Now, the first thing I want you to know is that uh, there are some of these things here. When you mouse over this, it'll tell you what you what it is. So I put in some samples here of some Spotify stuff. This is my client key, and this is my client secret. These are not things that I want to share with you. Um, and that would happen if I actually left clicked on it. It will show you the code that actually happens behind the scenes. But I don't want to do that. But if I wanted to inject some of these things, I easily can. And I'm going to do that here with this one here for URL ADLS. This is the connector that I use to connect to Azure Data Lake for our SkillWave sales. And if I just go right click on it and inject it, uh, what you'll see is that it injects the new Power Query right away for me here. Okay, now this is the link to, um, to our actual database on Azure Data Lake. The next thing that I do is I actually go and create a raw data orders query here. And this particular query, by the way, I should also mention I didn't even code this. This is just kind of a cool thing. If you hold control down and roll your mouse wheel up, just like in the DAX editors that Microsoft provides you, it actually gives you a zoom. Uh, but the interesting thing about here is that you'll notice that we actually use URL ADLS. This is actually feeding this, right? So I needed to have this in place here. I don't have anything to check the dependency chains on this, at least not yet. It's something I'd like to do, but it's going to be very, very complicated. But the nice piece about this is that I can now go and inject this, again, either by right-clicking on it and choosing inject or by saying inject here. This will create me a connection-only query. If it already exists, it will prompt me if I want to replace it. It doesn't. So boom, there we go. And it's going to throw me the, uh, the little sign here because I actually haven't got this authenticated. And I'm not going to right now because this is my customer data. I can't show you that, uh, but I do want you to see just sort of how this stuff goes in. I'm going to play with an example here, though, that uh, that I can show you data. So here we go. A um, couple of cool things just to uh, to note on this. Uh, we have the ability to right click, move up, right click, move down. Okay. If you want to rename a query, we can do that as well. So um, I will I'll show you. You can just rename right here. And there we go. It puts in the original name. You can change it. Say okay. What kind of database functionality you expect. If I go over here to squints, this one here is a query that actually reads a grouped data set. So it reads from um, the training database that I use for my self-service BI bootcamp. It pulls the data out of the database. There's three different individual locations in this. One of them is called the squints, okay, uh, which is a derogatory term for accountants, if you didn't know. Um, so that's one of the divisions. The other two are tax evader and ethical development. And the sales data that I have in here spans from 2019 to 2013, or 2009 to 2013. Uh, so this particular query, if I run it, will actually read from a specific view in the database, multiply two columns together, group it up to get me the total sales, and filter it into one specific location in one year. So you'll notice that this one is tagged to load to the data model, and if there's anything different here, prompt if I'd like to replace it. So I'm going to go and inject it. And what you'll see is it is actually makes a connection-only query first. This is just a normal sort of practice here. And then it goes and it actually loads it to the data model because that's where I told it to go. So it's creating a data model connection right now. Uh, hopefully, it won't take too long given that it's taking it from Azure. No, nope, 15 rows. That's good. And if I mouse over it, I should be able to get the preview to show you what's actually in here. Here we go. 2009 sales for the squints for class category and whatnot. Okay, so this is basically what the, the M code query is doing. Now, what happens if I want to change it? What if I want the 2013 sales? Okay, so I can just change it right here and say inject. I don't even need to save it. And it says, hey, it already exists. Are you sure? I'll say yes, absolutely. So there we go. Um, one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't 
automatically cause the query to refresh. And this is something that I've been trying to decide whether or not it's a good idea to do or not. Uh, Christian, I see your question. Is the code formatable here? Um, I don't have my parser hooked up to this and tokenizer and, and everything else yet. It is something that I'm thinking about, but this is, I mean, see, this is the V1. That is something that I can add afterwards. So, um, so yeah, because I, I agree. I mean, it would look much prettier if it was beautified, wouldn't it? Um, all right, so here's the thing. When I mouse over this, um, you'll notice that it is showing me the preview of 2013, even though it hasn't loaded to the data model yet. I'm trying to decide whether or not I should actually do a, an, a forced reload on this. I, I don't think that's a good idea, um, but of course we can obviously refresh it and at that point it would load the new data into the data model. Now, uh, can I also change the name directly? Uh, would it load automatically as new? In other words, can I change it up the top here to 20, uh, the 2013 sales summary? Is that what you're looking for? Uh, if I go with that and inject it at this point, it's not a conflict. It will create a new query. Okay, so uh, it's not going to change the existing one that's there. Um, it's going to do something different in that particular case because it's not actually conflicting. So here's the other thing, though. Let's go back to 2009. And let's say, well, actually, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's make this the 2013 sales summary. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to update it right now. And what you can see is it now has an updated name for 2013 sales summary. And if I go in there, it's actually saved that. If I decide now, if I were to go back and change this to 2009 and then inject it, it would now prompt me to overwrite this one here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go and switch this back to 2009. I'm going to set that back to 2009. I'm going to update it. I'm going to inject it and overwrite it because I want this one to actually be 2009's data. There we go. It's all good. When I refresh, it's going to pick that up. Okay, so I think this is the kind of database management that people would sort of expect in this particular case. But what I want to do at this point is I'm just going to right click and delete this one for a second, because what I want to show you now is where I think um, this can actually be like, this is cool. I mean, it's just basically a glorified um, copy paste for a, a text file library right now. But I wanna show you what I'm doing with this thing to try and make this better. And I do want you to be aware that what I am gonna show you right now is a very V1 version of this. This is not how I intend to leave this, okay? I want a form to pop up to give you the options to do everything that I'm gonna show you right now, but I haven't had time to code that. And I wanted to get something out and I didn't wanna push the meetup back another week. So here's the deal. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to choose to add a new query here. And I'm gonna use Squint's 2009 sales as the basis for this. So I'm gonna select this. You'll notice down the bottom here, this no longer says update because I chose add new before I cho chose this. It's now saying, would you like to save your new query? So what I'm gonna do with this thing here is I'm gonna just zoom in on this one a little bit more here because I want to do um, a couple things with this. And actually, I'll tell you what, I'm even going to put a line break in this thing here just to edit this up a little bit. Maybe we'll even, uh, I don't know how the heck to actually like get a, a tab character into some of these things um, properly uh, without, because if I hit tab, I move to the next control, but let's, let's do that. Okay. So what I actually want to do here is I want to, I want to prompt um, sales, uh, location and year summary okay so that's a pretty horrible handle here um, but you know this is going to prompt you all right what i want is i want when i go to inject this query i want to get prompted to say okay so what year do you actually want and again this is very v1 so i'm going to tag this i'm going to right click it and i'm going to choose to prompt it for a value and it inserts this prompt value here I also want to prompt for the location. So for this one here, I'm going to prompt for text. Now, what I want you to recognize about this right now is this is very limited. This only allows you to do one component of each of these three at the moment, okay? My intention is that you will be able to actually do a lot more with this, where you'll be able to actually control the name of the prompt. You'll be able to do some different things. The challenge is I've got to be careful just how much stuff I insert into this, this piece here as well, because this query, obviously, if you copy and paste it now, will no longer work, okay? Uh, the other thing that is, well, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So here's the deal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this now. Notice that it's going to load directly to the data model. Okay. So I'm going to save it. There we are. And now I'm going to come back to prompt for the sales location. So this is the one that now has these prompt values in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose to inject it. And it says, please enter a value. I'm going to go with 2012 because we haven't used that one yet. 
And then it says, please enter a text. So let's go with a different division here. We're going to go tax evader. And it creates the query. And it goes through. And uh, if all goes well, ah, uh, shoot. Um, so it turns out that I left this with connection only. I didn't load this to the data model because that's the default state. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go with data model. And you know what? If the action, if the item already exists here, I don't actually want to be prompted. I just want to replace this overall. So I'm just going to update that right now and then inject it. And uh, at this point, all right, let's do it again. So we'll go 2012. We'll go tax evader. And at this point, it now gets written. Because it already existed, I can't change the load destination. That's the one tricky part on this thing. But what you will notice is that this is 2012 and tax Vader. I'm going to need to look at that because if this one changes the load destination, I feel like I need to actually switch that out. So um, I'll change that manually for right now. That's a bug that i got to get on my list. But the cool thing here is that I have just prompted for those items and actually put them into the query properly so that they actually show up there. So that's pretty awesome stuff. Now, what I want to show you is working with queries is really, really easy for me. What if the location doesn't exist? Uh, well, that's on you, man. So <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, but what if the location doesn't exist? Let's uh, let's do this. So um, let's go with, uh, I'm just going to rename this one right up here. I'm going to call this bad location. I'm not going to save this, but I'm going to inject it just so we get one that uh, doesn't work. So we'll go 20, well, let's go 2013. Uh, and uh, this is going to be bad location, which I don't have. So we'll see what actually happens when this one loads. We got zero rows loaded. Now, interestingly enough, the query is still working. Okay. If I go in and take a look at it, why is it still working? Well, if I go to the source, go to the navigation, it shows me the original table. I inserted my multiplication. I group my data. Just wait for the preview to refresh on this one here. So the preview is going to refresh based on what I did here. This will now give me a grouping by each one of my locations and years. This is just a filtered rows step in the query that says, hey, I want to filter those group rows down to the year equals 2013 in bad location. So the, the M code that I have written is absolutely valid. I just don't have a good location in here. The bigger question, to be honest with you, in this whole thing here is, what if you didn't tag the place properly, right? What if you tagged here? Well, then your query is going to blow up, right? What if you didn't tag this quote in there? Because I'm trying to tag the entry between those two quotes. At that point, things are going to blow up. So this does require you being careful with what you're inserting in the M code, right? I mean, it's going to it's going to require a little bit of M code knowledge for people um, to, to realize what they need to prompt. But at the end of the day, um, if you actually select everything properly, it's going to be good to go. And I'm, I'm not sure... Um, how much safeguards I can put on that one. Uh, I, I didn't really intend this to be a total kittens lost their mittens prompt it kind of thing along the way here. This was more for people who are, are you know, pro deving on this kind of stuff, I guess, or at least Power Query knowledgeable um, along the way to make this a little bit quicker for them. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. So hopefully that, that answers the question, Stephen. So the interesting thing, um, yeah, no, fair enough. You, you, I, listen, it is only V1, and I want your questions because these are the things that start making me think about other these things, right? I mean, I, I build this from the way that I work, and and I want this to work for other people, right? So, um, one of the interesting comments I heard from uh, from a buddy of mine years ago um, was, uh, you know, the uh, the fact of um, you know, when you build code for yourself, you only need a certain level of error handling. When you go to release it to other people in your company, you need to double the error or, you know, the error handling increases tenfold. And when you go to release it by public, you multiply that by a thousand, right? So um, is it designed for developers rather than end users? I mean, that depends, Henry. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're doing just a static, hey, I'm going to copy and paste this, there's no replacing of prompts in there. That prompts is more of a feature for, for people to, to, you know, go bigger and go better. So you know, I think there's a lot of people who still just copy an, a complete query out of a text file and use it over and over again. When you look at something like the URL ADLS and this raw data here, I just inject those. There's nothing that I'm not changing things on a regular basis. They're static queries that I reuse over and over again because I'm doing different things at the end. But the, um, the, the whole concept behind this one is there is an ability to actually get better or, or I guess more granular with it if you want to. Do I see everybody doing it? No. I mean, there's a lot of people who probably never even right click and discover that this is there. The people that are on this call, though, 
I don't think you would have let me release a feature like this unless I gave you this, right? I mean, this this starts to add some serious power, right? So, um, <laughs> Nick says every program that can shorten uh, why one line, every program has a bug, every program that can be shortened to one line doesn't work. Yeah, um, but it is still a developer function rather than end user like management users. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this 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 whole tool here is around people who are building models, right? I'm not going to give this to to uh, you know to the CEO to go and, and manage things. That's not who this tool is pitched at. This is built. At, this is targeted at people who are building models uh, that are trying to do it faster and, and better along the way, right? So, um, let me show you. So the the interesting thing around what we're dealing with here is that injecting queries is really, really, really easy for me. Oh, I should also mention this button's a pro feature. If you're not on a pro license, what we do is we copy it. We'll still prompt it. But we copy it for you, so you got to go and actually paste it yourself. Okay, so this is where just you know those little things that, that the pro license makes things easier. So the interesting part around this though is injecting queries is really easy because I can take any one of these and I know where to go. There's only one container for Power Queries inside this object model, so I know what the name is called, I know what the code is called, I know where it's going to go, and boom, I can just inject it. Measures are harder because measures belong on tables. Today, you cannot inject a measure directly from here, okay? I want to do this at some point, but it's gonna involve me doing more work on things because this needs to pop up a form to say, which table would you like to store this on? And then there's some other components that I wanna add on this. But here's what I wanna do for this right now. So actually, let me cancel on this one here for a second. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna, gonna um, skip out of this example here. I'm gonna close this one. And I'm going to go back to the build better. I'm going to use the completed version that I have here because on this one, I want to go and add a new measure to this. Now, in my SSBI bootcamp, I actually give people a PDF of a whole bunch of different DAX date time intelligence patterns that are pretty much ready to go. The problem is that you got to copy it out of the PDF, paste it into the code window, and then you have to change the individual pieces that you need to change, like your measure names and things like that. So I'm going to work with a very, very simple pattern right now to build a month-to-date measure. I'm pretty sure that everybody that works with Daxter knows how to build this one. So here's what it's going to look like, is I'm going to come over to BiblioMonkey, and I'm going to go and say, all right, month-to-date, here it is. The pattern looks like this. It's total month-to-date, pretty easy. Prompt measure, you'll notice that I put it inside the square braces, okay? And calendar date, because I always use tables called calendar and date. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this. Now, I should say here, well, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to ask to enter a measure. In an ideal world, this would prompt you with a list of all of your measures so you just get to choose it. That's where I want to go. But for right now, I'm just going to go and say, let's use sales dollars, which is the name of the measure over here. Okay. So all the information that's here right now is really not relevant because I can't copy any of that and use it anywhere. But I got some plans, so bear with me on this one. So I'm going to say exit on this one now, and I'm going to come over here to measures, new measure. I'm going to go store this on my measures table. We're going to call this MTD sales. Paste it. We'll check the formula just to make sure it works. And this is kind of important because, as you saw, it prompted me the actual code signature from BiblioMonkey. Uh, so I can let me go in there right now has the prompt here. But when I, when I went and said, I want to copy it, it popped for me to say, what is the measure you want to use? And I say it's sales. Now, I still have to do the work on this right now. This is not awesome. And uh, you know, one thing you learn about me is I'm inherently lazy, I mean efficient. So I want this stuff done for me. So I, I'm going to be motivated to fix this, right? But for right now, for V1, this is actually dropping this, or I can go and paste this in, say, OK. It's going to add it to the pivot table. And there we go. I've got my month today's sales. OK, so everything looks good there. What I want to show you now is what happens when this gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, so this one here is a DAX measure pattern. You may be able to write a better one, that's not the point. This one here is using something that allows me to get month to date for X number of months prior. Okay, so this is a pattern you can copy out of the book if you come to my class. And basically what you need to do is you need to uh, back up how many months you want in this particular area. So you'll notice that I put in, instead of saying minus one and changing the values, I've got minus prompt value prompt value. So I'm using the same thing twice here. And then I've got between the square braces prompt measure. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy this one. 
it says, what's the value you're going to use? I'm going to say, I want one month different. So we're going for month today, prior month. I'll say, okay. And then what's the measure? And I'll say sales dollars. Because I've used the same variable in here, it's actually quite powerful because in some cases we do use the same number in two places and have to update it. So this allows me to actually only do the replacement once. We've got the copy of it. That's cool. So now if I hop over here and go into measures, new measure, and go with MTD uh, prior month, paste that in, check the formula. All looks good. That's good. One dial, oops, let's not go there. We're going to go that way. And now we can see that it actually works in this case here too, which is fantastic. So this is actually really, really useful in that we can actually use the same value in here. But it also, to me, and I'm giving you the very, very honest version of this here, anything here to me and to where I see a particular issue here is that what if I want to prompt for multiple different values? I might want prompt for value one, prompt for value two. And when I go and do something like a copy right now, it says, please enter a value. Well, that's not really telling me what it is. So my goals for where I'm going with this thing here is what I want to do is I want to get to the point where you can actually tag this with prompt value one with a description. So it actually says what you're supposed to be putting in, right? So please enter a number of months, right? Or please enter or whatever else. Um, but I still want you to be able to actually use these things twice. So I need to come up with a way that I can actually make that work. And I, I know what I need to do in this particular case. The challenge is that I need to um, go and explore some regex parsing patterns and regex is not my forte. So I've got to do a little bit of development work there. But that's kind of the idea behind the scenes here. The other thing that I really want to do with this is that I want to leverage what's going on down here. Right now I can't because I can't get it on a copy. But there is an area where it would make sense to actually use this. So one way would be for me to go right click and inject, pop up a form that says, give me the table and show me all of the different prompts that need to be replaced. I want to do that. And then the other place that it would make sense to actually have an inject feature for your DAX measure is right here. When you go and say, right click, inject, and it injects it right here because then I can tell you exactly. You right click on a specific table. You've now told me exactly what table you want it to go on to. And then I can use the defaults from BiblioMonkey. So I anticipate that that will probably come before um, a, another user form there. We'll just use those defaults to write them in there. Um, but uh, that's one of the thoughts that I had there. The other one is in Query Sleuth. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to right click here and inject your queries from BiblioMonkey right here. If you're looking at your code in this area and saying, hey, you know, geez, I, I recognize that there's something going on in this. Oh, shoot. I know I've got a query in BiblioMonkey I want to use. You should be able to inject it right in this area here. I was really hoping to have that done for for uh, for this release. I just the uh, the UI inside BiblioMonkey was a lot more problematic than I was expecting it to be. Um, how can you add queries to the library? Uh, that's a great question, Christian. Uh, basically, what you do is you go add new right here. Um, if you want to build off of one of the ones that's in here, you select it. If you don't, then at that point in time, you just say, hey, look, I want to do a DAX measure, or I want to do a, an Excel formula, or I want to do a query. Um, I have different containers for the different pieces that we're actually working with in this case here. Uh, I do want to sort of be just full disclosure on this. I have the intention of being able to inject queries into the workbook, which we already do inject DAX measures into the data model. I don't believe that that should be out of reach. Inject formulas into worksheet cells. I do not anticipate that I will ever inject VBA into the VBA object model. I think that one's gonna end up being a, hey, you can copy and paste it. And I don't believe I'll even be technically capable of injecting an Office script. Having said that, I think the Office script library today that is in here under the automate tab is almost unreadable. Like here, let me show you. Um, I have seven office scripts in this thing and you try and find the right one for what you're working with. It's brutal. Like it's just terribly sorted and whatever else. So the, uh, the nice part from this is that, you know, if I go and say, look, I mean, I want to grab, you know, my here, here, I'll show you how to add, add something, Christian. So if I take a look at the code editor on this one, let's say that uh, I want to grab this guy here. So I'll go control a control C. And if I decide that I want to have this guy in here, I'll go to BiblioMonkey, we'll go add new. This one here is gonna be an office script. And this one here is uh, wrap text, oops, wrap text, uh, wraps 
uh, text in all columns in the table, I think. Can't totally remember. I'll paste that in there and hit save. And just like that, there is my wrap text office script that's that's in there ready to go. So this is another reason, uh, Christian, just for rec uh, for um, recognition on this one, why there's no formatting on this, because not only do I have to work with my Power Query, I also have to have my DAX working on this using the right tokenizer and parser on the right one. And I don't have one for formulas, VBA or office script. So that could be a whole another ball of wax. So. Um, so okay, you have used prompt value for months as a variable in DAX and reuse that var in other vars. Uh, dude, what the heck does that mean? Um, I'll have to think on that one. I'll have to try and actually uh, figure out exactly what you're uh, what you're talking about on that one, to be honest with you. So um, okay, for months. Uh, can maybe the file be saved on OneDrive so you can save it once and use it in different PCs and avoid having duplicates? <laughs> yeah, awesome. So check this out. If I go to global options and I go and hit the file path through where this is stored, this is stored in OneDrive uh, Excel uh, documents and it's stored in the monkey tools folder. Um, this folder syncs across all of my PCs. So yes, absolutely, absolutely, it can. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to do. So the default directory um, for, your, um, for your stuff that we use is actually uh, an environment variable. Um, that actually returns your local documents folder. So if that local documents, or sorry, I shouldn't say local, it returns your documents folder. So if that documents folder happens to be syncing to SharePoint uh, or OneDrive personal, doesn't matter, um, at that point in time, yes, it will be written into that area. So if you're using the same OneDrive on multiple computers, yes, you can sync it across multiple PCs. So, um, and yes, I appreciate that you are also efficient. And um, that was one of the key things is that I didn't want to have different databases across different PCs because I happen to work on my desktop for development, but when I'm off in hotel rooms, I work on my laptop for development. So it had to sync back and forth. So absolutely. Um, so yeah, so at any rate, I mean, I, I'm curious, I mean, just, just thoughts and thoughts and impressions and, and whatnot, um, you know, uh, you know, macros and TE3. So listen, I don't know what, uh, I mean, is TE3, that's not Excel, but, um, you know, there's, there's a library here, I guess you could use it if you wanted to. Um, the other thing I should probably show you is we can create new folders uh, in these things here. So if I wanted to, uh, you know, to go and have a uh, uh, time intelligence uh, or time intel patterns, um, folder inside uh, my month to date measures or in, inside my measures folder, I can do that. Um, I do, oh, tabular under three, there you go. Um, I do not have drag and drop capability inside this. So if you want to move something into, I, I'm going to work on a better method for this. But as for V1 right now, if you want to change this, you need to uh, come up and change the pattern here and hit update. Oh, that's not good. Okay, there we go. Ken's got a bug he's got to fix there. Um, I had that uh, built and that looked like it was a really bad unhandled exception. All right. Uh, anyhow, that will get fixed. Um, I will try and get that one fixed tomorrow. Oh, awesome. I, now I crashed something. Um, so at any rate, I'll get that one sorted out and uh, and make sure that it, uh, it works a little bit better. But um, but yeah, so hopefully, um, hopefully I haven't destroyed my database in the process. That would be absolutely amusing as anything. That was the one thing I was trying not to do is cause myself an, a catastrophic error uh, while I was uh, while I was presenting on the stuff, if there is, then I will go and uh, oh shoot, love that. Hold on one second. Let me just go and uh, and delete something from that folder or from that file uh, that is going to be in my documents and monkey tools. Um, for for reference on this thing here too, I don't know how many of you um, are are, are uh, access people or whatever else, but the back end database for this is just an access. That's all it is. So um, if I want to go and uh, and get rid of uh, this guy here, let's go to order one. That's fine. And where is my? It was month to date. Go to folder ID. That can't be right. Yeah, that one should be in folder ID eight. All right. So I think I know what's happened there then. Eight, enter, and let's go see if that made any difference. No, I'm going to have to go back and actually figure out what's going on. Um, okay, can I use multi-select, multi-paste queries, or multi-inject? Uh, no, I can't do that. Um, the Not at the moment. Um, it's not one of those things that, uh, that I've actually looked at to try and figure out um, 
how I'm going to uh, going to sort of um, solve that particular issue, uh, or if I'm even going to. I sort of see this as more of a one-off uh, one-off basis and and whatnot. So um, there's an API for Power Query Formatter. Um, okay, so so that's a great question, Christian. Um, there is an API for Power Query Formatter. Uh, the challenge with doing something like that is that if I go and use an external API to call this stuff, that absolutely kills your ability to use this when you're disconnected. And that is uh, that is another piece that to me was absolutely critical because yours truly flies all over the world. And I don't pay for Wi-Fi on airplanes because I'm not that rich. So I don't want to be in a situation where something doesn't work. I mean, that was actually one of the major factors behind building something like, you know, smart file and smart folder was that these things, I, I wanted a scenario that actually worked when my SharePoint was not syncing. So, I mean, I have some, I have some very serious concerns on that. Um, you know, I think that the tool is fantastic and I think that that site is great. Uh, I'm also a little bit leery of having a, a product that I charge for that's leveraging a free service to go and actually make calls. I don't think that's very ethical. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we did actually invest in building our own um, Power of Query uh, formatter in uh, inside Monkey Tools. Having said that, it needs to be rebuilt. And um, I don't know if, if uh, many of you are aware of this, but um, I used to have a developer on staff full time working on this. Uh, he actually left me last May and has gone on to uh, to different things. So I am now the sole person responsible for actually working through this stuff. So I have to be a little bit careful on that parser with something he built. So uh, and he did an amazing job, um, but it's uh, it's one of those things. It's kind of uh, it's a big thing. So I'm not sure how uh, how quickly I'm going to go. So uh, yeah, I mean, I could I could do something like that, Christian, for sure. I'm more concerned about about using a pay for product to leverage free services. I, I, I I don't know if that would be within their terms of service. If it is, then maybe I'll think about it for sure. So um, thoughts or questions? Uh, um, yeah, I need more hours in my time zone. I need more hours a day. I need the metric clock with 100 hours a day. So um, so are there access components under Monkey Tools? No. Um, the, the ACCDB file is just an, uh, we actually leverage ADO to connect to it. Um, so you can create it on the fly and whatnot. Um, all of the dependencies that, uh, that are needed for this stuff um, should be there. Uh, if anybody ever runs into a scenario where, because um, it's, it's MDAC or the components that are actually used, and I believe that MDAC has been shipping uh, with Office now for since 2007 earlier. Um, so you shouldn't have any problems connecting to it. Uh, we create the database on the fly. When you first launch BiblioMonkey, it will actually spin up. We use a script to actually create the database with the proper tables and, and whatever else in the right formats. Um, so, I mean, from a from a technical point, just because uh, some of you seem interested in this, I'll just show you what's, what's actually here. There's a very simple version table. Um, so this has some implications that if I need to actually make changes, I can. Uh, we have a very simple items table. Um, basically, all I had to do was go back and actually fix this because that's what uh, that's what blew up on me is my folder ID was not picked up correctly. I've got an error in the way that that happened. I'm going to get that sorted. Um, and we've got a folders table. And that's all there is so far right now um, at this point. Uh, there may be more later. There probably will be more later. I should say that. Um, but, uh, you know, for the grand scheme of things, it's very, very simple at this point in time, and uh, and the framework is there so that I can upgrade it to make it more complicated. As you can imagine, I have ideas and I have plans. The one thing that I'm I'm always hurting on with this stuff is time, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So, anyway, I'm looking at the clock, guys. I've run this now to like we're at an hour and twenty. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to be keeping folks beyond what they want to be here. Um, so, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're finding this stuff interesting, then by all means, I mean, I can, I can stick around and chat for a few more minutes, but, um, I'm, I'm very, <laughs> time is always the biggest problem. Um, I'm very curious. I mean, what, what are your, what are your thoughts from, from all of you? I mean, from seeing this, I mean, does this look like a feature that, uh, that is useful that, uh, that you'll be able to actually make use of? I mean, I know I've had a lot of feedback from people wanting something like this, so I'm kind of hoping that it's, it's fitting the bill. Um, as I say, the big pieces that I think will really be value adds to this that I want to work on are being able to actually inject directly in Query Sleuth or Dax Sleuth, um, as well as, uh, oh, there you go, Nick. Nick's loading up his snippets right now. All right, when it blows up, Nick, let me know. Uh, hopefully it doesn't, but you know where the uh, where the um, where the uh, the little menu item is over here for uh, logging a bug. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's um, like I say. One of the big things that I really, really want to get sorted with this is 
I'm not happy with the copy ability on this that's doing this this um you know please enter value here what i really want is i want one page that pops up for something like a dax page that says and it's got everything on it it says what table would you like to inject it into what name would you like to call this and here are all of the different parameters that are being prompted so you can go and actually choose them uh i should actually mention with this one here too um the prompts that we use for dax text value measure table and column so my idea behind this thing here is that if you say prompt for measure that form when it comes up to say prompt for measure would actually give you a list of all of the measures that are valid that you can actually use if you are saying prompt for table it would give you a prompt of all of the table names and if you're saying it was prompt for column that one i'm thinking about it would make sense for column but i guess what i'm wondering i'd love to hear from from you guys on this one here should it say prompt for column being only a column name or should there be an, an additional option that is prompt for qualified column that is giving you qualified table and column name? Are there instances where you would need one or the other is, is I guess what I'm asking. And I'd be curious to your thoughts on, on those uh, kind of things. So um, anybody's got feedback on that, please, uh, by all means, uh, throw it in. So um, my feeling is that it would probably need a prompt for qualified column, prompt for table and prompt for column individually. Um, anyway, I mean, so those are, are some of the cool things that, uh, that I'm looking at there. Um, when I start thinking about formulas, I think this is much further down the road, but, you know, the idea behind that one is be that, you know, you'd actually have the ability to inject from monkey tools right by the context menu right on the right click of the worksheet. So if you right click on a worksheet, you'd be able to say insert here and we'd probably have some prompts for, you know, replace it with the contents of the active cell versus a relative reference versus a, a you know, a hard coded reference or something like that. Um, so again, I mean, I'll look at, uh, I'm going to look at these things and, and I have some ideas that I need to play with. How quickly I'll get there, I don't know, but I did want to get this out because I haven't released a new feature in a long time. So um, Christian, thank you. I appreciate it. I, uh, I, I hope that uh, that you'll be able to actually make use and, uh, and that you'll be able to save your patterns in it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I have a feeling I know the next question that comes from Christian is when do I get a UI for this thing inside uh, inside Power BI so that I can do it right from there and that one will be a, a one day kind of thing. Um, so any rate, uh, if anybody has any other questions, please um, please don't hesitate to ask on these. Um, I'm going to go and uh, and just go back to my uh, my PowerPoint deck and and sort of throw up the uh, the closing slide for this thing here. So um, if you're looking for Monkey Tools resources, um, you can find them at monkeytools.ca. Uh, I do need to go and actually do some documentation on this and get it onto the site um, because this is as I say is so fresh. I just finished coding what I've got here so far, and I do want to actually sort of you know. Um, amp up some of these pieces before I do a full amount of documentation on it. But uh, but I do want to get some in there about you know how to add queries, manage queries, and, and, and different things like that. Uh, the key thing to remember on this thing, if you are a, a free user on this one here, um, we will still let you um, save new items. We will still let you, um, we, we just won't let you inject them directly. You will copy them. And uh, as far as the um, as far as the prompting goes, uh, my feeling is is that I will probably not provide the right click context menu for prompting, but I would still allow it to be honored. And the reason for that is because if you are a pro user and eventually fall back to a free Monkey Tools license, I don't want you to lose functionality if you've tagged anything. But I see that that ability for being able to tag something for prompting would be a pro feature um, generally on it, unless you you know you sneak under the hood and write it manually. I don't care if people are writing things manually. That doesn't bother me. Um, my tool is about convenience. So um, do I know anything about Microsoft's plans announced to save and curate a personal query collection uh, in Power Query cited by MK? Um, do I know anything about it? Uh, I've signed an NDA. So <laughs> I'm not sure how much is public on that one um, uh, from, from what uh, MK has talked about. Um, so I can't really comment on it. Uh, I know that they have plans in that area, Brian, um, that I can say, um, but they don't detract me from doing my plans. So, um, you know, when I look at what I'm trying to do with this thing, again, that it's, it's about that feature integration with Monkey Tools, um, as well as I think some of the stuff that I'll be adding to mine that's different is that tagging feature, I don't think is something that they're going to be um, that they're going to be covering in there so right off the bat. So anyway, so uh, there you go. Christian says that there's something in the potentially in the March release. So 
Um, I know there's a roadmap for, for some of the stuff out there and whatnot. I haven't really followed it because uh, the stuff that I've, well, I haven't really followed it closely. Let's just say that. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, listen, if there's no other questions, um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, as I say, make sure that uh, if you're looking for, um, for, to, to try this out and, and whatnot. Uh, the version that you're actually looking for uh, is this one here. It's 1.0.8412.26100. If it doesn't end in 26100, uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you go to uh, your options monkey here and uh, check for update uh, because uh, I've actually published about six or seven different builds over the last few days. Um, I'm trying to work through a digital certificate issue and and uh, and get these things out as well. So um, so if your monkey tools was, uh, you know, has prompted for an update, it may not have this one here. So uh, price of the pro. Um, absolutely. So if you're uh, if you're looking for it, there's uh, two different ways that you can actually pick it up. Um, so the you can do it on a uh, on a monthly basis at, uh, at 999 US. Um, if you're in Canada, you have to pay tax on that. I'm sorry. Uh, if you are interested in picking up an annual billing, you can, it comes out to, to eight bucks a month. Um, so it's just that we bill it all up front annually and, and whatnot. Um, the key thing there that you can do is uh, there is a, a trial um, that, uh, that you can run for two weeks beforehand. The only thing that the trial does not do um, is when like it trials every pro feature except one. Um, and that one feature is this one here. If you go to monkey tools and run a model summary report, um, the model summary gets every other line of the detail in this stuff gets suppressed. Okay. This is one of those areas because this is documentation based. My feeling is if you're using documentation, there's a reason for it. And in that case, you can help me chip in to, uh, to help support the development uh, efforts and time that I put into this thing in order to build it up. Okay. So, um, but outside of that, every feature that is a pro feature will work um, full fidelity for two weeks. Uh, and then it just falls back to free license. So you can take your time to try and decide whether or not you actually want to, uh, to use it. Um, you can opt in, you can opt out if you want to do that. That's totally up to you it's up to you to manage your subscription how you want to do it um you know doesn't doesn't bother me um you know i figure i want people that, uh, that are actually using this stuff uh to be the ones that are paying i you know and again there's a free version that has a ton of functionality uh there it's just that the pro version has has a bunch more um hey one thing i did actually want to uh if you pay up front for the subscription uh is the feature the feature is available yeah if you pay if you pay up front for the pro subscription um basically what happens is you get a license key um, and uh, if you go into uh, to activate your license, you drop that license key in and everything unlocks. And if you have the free version downloaded and installed already, when you activate that pro license key, it unlocks all the features because there's only one installer for all this stuff. Um, the other thing, actually, I just wanted to show you for those of you who are using monkey tools, uh, nobody's commented on this, which is interesting. These two buttons, um, measures and KPIs, when you are installed on your monkey tools, these do not show up. Um, I have no way programmatically to add these to your ribbon. There is no ID MSO that I can actually connect to. And I've complained to Microsoft about this many times, but a bunch of experts look at it and we just cannot figure out how to get this through. These things just don't exist for whatever reason. Um, but you can get them here. And this is actually a tip that I learned from Christian. So thanks, Christian. I just want to show people if you're interested in this because it's really handy to have these here. So basically what you do is you, uh, you go um, right click and customize the ribbon. And uh, the monkey tools ribbon actually shows up here. So if you, uh, if you create a new group, which I've done here called measures custom, then what you do is you go over to popular commands. We go over to main tabs. Power pivot is one of the main tabs and the calculations group has measures and KPIs. You just add those to the new group that you created, move it into the right spot. And at that point in time, you now have these guys on your ribbon. I can't say whether or not Christian tells me that they last even across updates, which is great. I have not tested it um, because I'm constantly issuing new builds from Visual Studio. Mine disappear. Um, but uh, but it is a very, very handy thing to have in place. So um, just a, a quick little, you know, neat pro tip. Again, I wish I could do it programmatically because those belong there. Um, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I can't. So anyhow, um, awesome, Nick. I would uh, I would love to see you in the course next week. So uh, you know, by all means, um, you know, consider hard and uh, and hopefully we'll we'll see you there. Um, outside of that, I want to thank everyone again for coming. Um, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, you know, by far this is not all the, the features in Monkey Tools. Um, there's a, an awful lot more, but uh, 
but there you go. That's the uh, the big piece um, that uh, that we've added into this thing. So, um, thanks very much, folks. I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off for now. I will get the recording up uh, hopefully tomorrow on this one here, and um, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll hopefully see you uh, at the next meetup. And uh, if you have any questions on Monkey Tools, um, there are feedback uh, capabilities right on that uh, that menu, or you can hit the MonkeyTools.ca site and ask. Um, I would uh, I would love to hear from you and uh, and you know hear your thoughts on it. So, um, thanks very much, folks. We'll see you next time.